Hello! Ah, retro games. I do love me some old video games. In fact, I arguably love them a little bit too much, which is why I've got two full-size arcade machines in my living room. I shit you not. Look. There's Betsy and Bertha, as I call them. Anyway, we're here to talk about handheld stuff. Wouldn't it be nice if you had something with a giant screen on it that you could play old games on on the move? That's what we thought a couple of years ago when Arcos came out with their gamepad. It's essentially an Android tablet in an upside down box. Oh wait, that's better. It's an Android tablet with physical controls added to it. Hmm, we thought. Get some emulators on this, you might be having some fun. Well, it didn't quite work out like that, as I will tell you. Um, I mean, the box just basically pushes it as being something. You can play more ways to play Android games. Great. I mean, the thing about a good Android game is it's designed for a bloody touchscreen anyway, isn't it? And it comes with some shitty emulation layer where you can um, supposedly assign, you know, parts of the screen to the controls. It never worked properly, to say the least. But that wasn't what we were interested in, to be fair. And it has got a 7-inch capacitive screen, a 1.6 gigahertz dual-core CPU, quad-core graphics, HD 1080p, Wi-Fi, and all that stuff. Except that's bullshit. It was not a 1080p screen at all. It's 1024 by 600. Presumably that means it renders 1080p if you use the HDMI app. Out. The Eviltons, you are leading us astray. Map thousands of virtual control games. No, 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 no. We are entirely interested in our emulator. So I got one when they became cheap. They were originally about 120, 130 pounds, I believe. Here it is in all its surprisingly flat glory. Now, there's three things you need from it. The first one is battery life, which isn't great, about three hours, which is not exactly fantastic, but you know, long enough for a train journey or whatever. The second thing you need from it is a good screen. We'll come on to that in a second. And the third thing you need, and arguably the most important, is good controls. And oh crikey, this doesn't have those. Start off, you've got these horrible nubs. Uh, these are really, really dreadful. They're like a rip-off of the PSP nub from back in the day, except you have to put an incredible amount of force on them to actually get them to move at all. They're really, really horrible, and they don't fit well under your thumbs, and they slip around, and they probably turn into snakes and bite you in your sleep. Well, everything pretty much up to that point. The buttons are quite unpleasant. Uh, you can move them around, it hurts your thumbs a bit. Um, they're very definite action-wise, which I quite like, but what I don't like is that you have to, again, put far too much force onto them. And the D-pad is just another set of those. Try doing a few firewalls on that, and you'll take all the bloody skin off your thumb. Um, you've got shoulder buttons here for your fingers, and the other two shoulder buttons are here. Yes, they've moved them down here, meaning it's almost impossible to use. It's, it, you're going to get instant cramp just trying to press those buttons. However, it doesn't matter too much, because really this doesn't actually have enough power to emulate anything where you might want analogue nubs or shoulder buttons particularly. Uh, so, basically, it's a bit of a bust, because you can't really control it too well. Well, you, if you do, you're going to take all your bloody skin off your hands. So what's the screen like then? The other aspect. Yep, as you probably guessed, it's frickin' shite. It's really astonishingly bad, actually. Um, it's... Uh, uh, yeah! It's got this dirty, murky, grainy look to it. Um, it reflects light like nothing on Earth, and it's got a really bad field of view. The contrast goes crazy if you're not looking at it from a certain angle. So basically, it's unpleasant to use, but then you can't control it anyway, and blurg, load your emulators on it, and just kind of wish you were dead. And it came preloaded with Angry Birds just to really piss me off. So that was the end of that dream. I couldn't even be bothered to review it until now. But the years passed, and a company came along that actually had a decent attempt at it. It made a few models, and the latest one is this. All the boxes are upside down today. It is the JXD S7800. This is not quite the latest model. I believe there's a B model now, which has like 16 gigabytes of onboard storage, but this only has eight. But anyway, it's a quad-core smart game console, and it's got like a soldier climbing out of it. I don't think that actually happens. It also doesn't spray fire, which is probably a quite a good thing. Um, yeah, we've got generic Chinese box. Let's have a quick look at bits of it. 7-inch IPS display, resolution 1280 by 800. That's better. 5-point capacitive touch panel, Android 2, quad-core CPU, 8 gigabyte flash. We don't really care. It's got a shit front camera and not a very good rear one either. Don't really want cameras on it, because as they are actually pushing, Emulator games. Oh yes. This is all about getting your old games on it and making a play of it. Let's have a look at the unit itself. It is indeed 
slightly fatter than the Arcos, but that's because it's far better, frankly. I apologise for very reflective screen, by the way, um, that's because I've put a screen protector on it. And look, that's where there's a little bit of dust underneath it. That always bloody happens, doesn't it? It's particularly with a screen this size. Anyway, um, yes. It's got cameras, we don't care, it's got an SD card slot, I don't particularly care about that either, to be honest, because, um, well, it might come in useful one day, but even with only the 8GB, I've not actually put on enough ROMs to fill it up as yet. But if you do get going with PlayStation 1 games, that could fill up pretty quickly. Yes, it plays PlayStation 1 games, but we shall get onto that after we've looked at it physically. Right, buttons. You've got your ones at the top for your shoulders, and they're actually in sensible positions. Um, not the most comfortable thing in the world, but plenty use. You've got headphone socket, obviously you've got a power socket, which is interesting. Um, you can't seem to charge it through USB, you have to use an actual um, power adapter uh, specific thing there, which is quite annoying. You've got HDMI out, which works a treat, but let's face it, playing games on the television, you've, there's much better options than a little handheld thing like this. And now the controls. Now we is talking. You've got these analogue sticks, which actually feel quite nice, to say the least. They actually let you control things nicely. What more do you bloody want? The only weakness is they spin, which I find a bit odd, um, especially because if you thumb stick to them occasionally, I've had once or twice, actually the things spin round and it didn't quite control properly. That's literally only happened to me like twice in the whole time I've been using it, but it has happened, so I thought I'd mention it. Uh, D-pad isn't bad, actually. I didn't like it when I first got out of the box, because it feels slightly spongy. But actually, absolutely perfect for doing, um, you know, your mighty Hadoukens in Street Fighter 2 and all that stuff. And I can even do Zangief 720 degree thing very, very easily with it, so I was quite impressed, actually. Again, the buttons here feel a bit spongy, but yeah, absolutely fine when you're using it. Maybe I'm just too used to micro switches. I don't know, but they've worked absolutely fine while using it, which is what's important. Here you've got more physical buttons, which probably should have been on the Arcos one, really, because, you know, the whole point is it's got physical buttons. Anyway, let us turn it on and have a look. Although actually, before we do, I should mention, battery life is about four hours, so better than the Arcos, but still not great, and there's no Bluetooth inexplicably no Bluetooth connectivity whatsoever, which is a bit of a pain. If you did want to use one external controller, tough tits, it ain't gonna happen. But anyway, let's switch her on and have a look at what old games we can play. The screen is far, far nicer. Not only is it higher resolution than the other one, but it looks bloody great. It's got really nice color definition. Contrast is great, it's incredibly clear. It's what we in the trade call crystal, if we want to use stupid phrases. Right then, I think what I'm gonna do actually is turn off the lights and then you can see this a bit clearer. Jump gut. Ah, that's better. Right, we swipe across for yes, there is a touch screen as well. Obviously, it's still a tablet. And here are all the emulators, what I got installed like. Um, nearly all of these are free. I think you can pretty much get all of them for free in some manner. Um, I've actually paid for a few of them. They're by a bloke called, um, uh, I've forgotten his name, should have written it down, Robert Bruglia, Robert Broglia, something like that. It always seems a bit cheeky to pay money for emulators, and they're at three quid a pop, but they did seem to be noticeably better to me, you know, better UI and nicer to use and that. But your mileage may vary, there's no reason to spend any money if you don't want to. Now, I'm going to skip the obvious two emulators, the NES and SMS, the old Sega Master System, and Nintendo. Nintendo Entertainment System uh, work perfectly as you would expect them to. And frankly, I don't have any uh, particular personal attachment to any games on those systems, so they're not something I have really used. However, I do have a list of games, of games that this must run correctly in order to get the big kiss of me liking it. I shall now go through them all, and we shall see what they are like for the different formats. First up, Oh yes, Super Ghouls and Ghosts, one of my favourite of these Super Nintendo games. Look how high he can jump for a man dressed in full plate armour. Anyway, this works absolutely perfectly, so gets the kiss for the Super Nintendo emulation. Also, it should be pointed out, I could not find any Super Nintendo game it did not work with perfectly. Even awkward stuff and little weird technical bits all seem to work perfectly, so hats off to it and go for it, Arthur. Oh, you're running round in your pants, you crazy knight! Mega Drive-wise, it has to be Streets of Rage 2, one of my favouritest games ever. And possibly my favourite uh, video game soundtrack ever, in its way, which is an oddity, really, because I don't generally like this sort of music. But it's so funky and all that. And you've got to play as Max, of course, because he's massively overpowered. And he can do this. 
and he can do this. And then he can pick up apples on plates that he's found in the street, which inexplicably heal him. Which is something I feel modern medicine has never really worked into. Um, yeah, anyway, everything I tried on Mega Drive worked absolutely perfectly. Oh, I should point out, by the way, that uh, they have clever sort of methods of um, blurring all the pixels and trying to make them look smoother and that. I have all those turned off because I am old school and I think it looks weird. I'm just going to break this man's neck. Perfect! Oh, violence, unnecessary kidnapping. It's got to be the English Tier Pub, or whatever the hell this place is, as we say hello to Double Dragon Advance on the Game Boy Advance, a bloody fantastic game. It's kind of a combination of Double Dragon 1 and 2, but, um, well, with extra moves and all sorts of stuff in, and you can pull crazy poses like that. What isn't to like? Whoop. Love that sound effect. Yeah, I absolutely love this game, and it works absolutely perfectly, as does every single Game Boy Advance game I have chucked at this. So you can now play your Game Boy Advance stuff on a giant screen. Although it must be said, Game Boy Advance kind of being a portable system anyway, so not a hundred percent of uh, importance, but hey, you can get everything together for your train journey and then play it on a big screen and then punch people like this. Hoof! Ah, Delta by Stavros Fasoulis, one of my favourite Commodore 64 games, and one that it must emulate to get the thumbs up from me. But frankly, it's such an easy thing to be emulated these days that it's not a problem. And my god, it looks like absolute freaking crap through the uh, viewfinder at the moment, because it's blown all the contrast out. Whoa! And it's virtually impossible to play, because it needs quite quick reactions, and the viewfinder is not helping me with that. Anyway, it's a great game, it's very old, and yeah, Commodore 64 works perfectly on this, as you would probably bloody expect. Ah, now we're talking Neo Geo Pocket Color. This is a handheld from back in the day made by SNK. And although it was SNK, they had some Capcom stuff for it, like this Capcom vs SNK game. Match of the Millennium, which is rather excellent. Uh, indeed, another easy emulation. And oddly from a handheld system, so why would you bother? Well, pretty hard to get hold of the original hardware, and the screen in the original hardware was a bit ass, frankly, although it had one of the best uh, controllers ever seen for such little games. Little micro switched stick which I do miss but otherwise yep absolutely perfect working hats off to you my Neo Geo pick is an obvious one. It's the Mighty Metal Slug, one of my favouritest of games. Never enjoyed any many of the sequels, really. I don't know why that is. Maybe that's just me. But the first one is indeed a thing of beauty. Um, yeah, as you probably noticed, this is doing a much better job than that Neo Geo X Gold thing they released a year or two back. But then, that's not very difficult. And yes, it plays all your Neo Geo stuff perfectly, so we can all stand and shout huzzah. For PC Engine, I'm going with Super Star Soldier, which is a jolly shooter map that I always enjoy. Um, yeah, again, PC Engine, not exactly a super difficult one to um, emulate, to say the least. It's bloody difficult to play it through a viewfinder when you're holding the controls at a funny angle, but there we go. The main thing is I'm now shooting out giant polos and all the enemies are going to die. But yeah, PC Engine works perfectly. You would expect it that way, let's face it. Prepare yourself, for the season of the Moonstones is upon you, that'll teach you. Yes, now we get into slightly more complicated territory with the Commodore Amiga, and this particular game, Moonstone, being one of my absolute favourites. It's a goddamn weird game that has never really been, um... I don't know, never really had a format that's been copied by anything else directly. You basically fight a lot of very strange creatures which all are out to kill you in extremely brutal and bloody fashion, so you do the same to them before they manage it. For instance, these creatures look cute, but they'll not only bite you, but they attempt to hang you with their tails, as you can see above. It's a good one. Anyway, uh, Amiga emulation appears to work pretty much perfectly from what I can tell. Um, even got AGA games up and running. It is, of course, however, a massive ball ache to get anything running on it, as Amiga emulation does tend to be. There's lots of bosses and fiddling. But once you get it up there and your disk images in the right drives, hooray. Ooh, 26 GP. And of course, you can't have the Amiga without the Atari ST. Welcome to Stunt Car Racer, one of my absolute all-time favourites. You drive a car around a track, there's stunts involved, I'm sure you get the idea. And if you're playing through a viewfinder, you constantly fall off and smash your car up. But the important point is, Atari ST emulation, very fiddly, but works perfectly once you get it up and running. 
And now things get really interesting with a bit of PlayStation emulation. This is Tenchu, my go-to game for the emulation of the PlayStation, because it's bloody great. Look, here's Ricky Maru and his sword. Ah, those were the days before the shitty sequels. Anyway, yes, um, basically this runs absolutely fine. In fact, I've not been able to throw any PlayStation stuff at it, which it didn't work with fine. Um, the only thing is, some games did require to turn off all the clever smoothing effects we've got going on here. Um, they don't look quite as pretty, well, they look more like they did on the original PlayStation, funnily enough. But um, as a result, things do run properly. Uh, what was the one I particularly had a problem with? Tekken 3 was a bit funny, possibly due to the sort of high polygon models. But again, turning off the clever effects and it was running at a massive frame rate and we were all happy. That'll teach him for having a bow. And now things get really interesting with the not often seen N64 emulation, but running in a higher res. Um, this is a little bit glitchy. Um, you can see on the floor the sort of weird lines, um, but overall pretty much runs okay. On the downside, not that compatible with many games, to say the least. Um, in fact, Blast Core, which is my actual go-to game for N64 emulation, doesn't work in the slightest, which breaks my heart and means it gets a bit of a fail on this one from me. But yeah, Super Mario works, Ocarina of Time pretty much works, anything else is a bit hit and miss. I would not be getting it for N64 emulation. And when did Mario become this violent? Can't remember that. Now here's a super interesting one as we bring you Dreamcast emulation. Well, blimey crikey, yes it does that. On the downside, it doesn't do it very well to be perfectly honest with you. As you can see, Soul Calibur, my go-to game, has a bit of a uh, corruption problem on the menu. Let's go for the arcade. I shall be Killick, because he's got a stick. Bit of corruption on the screen there, to say the least, and versus Sofatia, you will soon see that the models in the game are fine, but the backgrounds are all a bit iffy as thus perfectly demonstrated. And it's a pity, because, you know, if it wasn't for that, it would run pretty well. Uh, to cut a long story short, the only game I know of which uh, runs absolutely perfectly, as far as I could tell, was Crazy Taxi. That was a pretty good go. Um, nothing else I've tried has worked uh, to the extent that you would actually want to play it. Uh, Shenmue, for instance, was really bad. It was running at like 10 frames a second or something. So yeah, Dreamcast emulation is currently a bit of an interesting uh, toy, but, you know, nothing you would actually want to spend any time playing games with. So there we are. It basically succeeds on all fronts until you get to N64 and Dreamcast, and then it all goes a bit tits down. Maybe they will at some point, um, you know, make the emulators better, but frankly this has been out a year or so, and I wouldn't be holding your breath for it. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Some other emulators are available. For instance, there's a PSP emulator, which seems totally pointless to me, because, you know, that's already got quite a big screen, and, you know, the games are very cheap for it and all that, and plus, to be perfectly honest, it was unstable and a bit shite. Any Anyway, and tragically, there is no working Sega Saturn emulator. Well, there is technically a working Sega Saturn emulator, but it's frankly useless. Uh, you can't really play anything on it, which breaks my heart a little bit, because I do love me some Saturn. Um, but overall, yeah, bloody fantastic. Uh, it's my new portable emulation machine. My only worry is I don't have a nice case to put it in. I'm scared I'll scratch the screen, hence the uh, screen protector on it. Um, something you do need to bear in mind, though, with anything like this, it's a little bit complicated. Um, I still haven't got MAME or Final Burn Alpha to actually run on it, which apparently they will work perfectly, so I'll have a fiddle with that later. But, you know, for arcade games I tend to stick to my arcade cabinet, so it's not something that's going to worry me greatly, but it is something that works, apparently. Remember, these are slightly fiddly devices if you want to use emulators. Don't just expect to buy one and have everything working immediately. You're going to have to spend some time and a few brain cells. But overall, uh, yeah, bloody marvellous, and it's currently being sold, unfortunately, only by one company in the UK, Funstock, so there's no competition or nothing, and they're doing it for £130, um, which isn't bad, frankly, but if you look around and can find one secondhand a bit cheaper, you go for that, as long as they haven't scratched the screen. I shall give you a link to Funstock below. In fact, I think this unit came from Funstock via my friend Alan. Thank you, Alan. You helped me out there. In fact, I'm going to give you a link to Alan's YouTube channel. If you like uh, racing video games or car-related video games in general, you should totally check it out. It's one of those channels which, frankly, isn't as big as it should be because it produces intelligent and interesting content instead of just pointing at games and shrieking, which seems to be the current uh, raison d'etre for gaming YouTube channels. But anyway! 
I thoroughly love this thing and you can probably play Android games on it as well if you particularly want to do that kind of thing. And as a result, I give it my scissors of approval. Now I'm scared they'll scratch the screen.